So we are live and I'm just here to welcome you all to LAU New York and to thank uh, Mrs. Nadasara for giving us this amazing presentation and, and my colleague Ed Shiner for, for arranging it. Uh, Ed is the director of alumni in, the, in North America and uh, I, I want to hand over for him to, to moderate the, the talk and the discussion. But before that, I'm, I just want to say that this is such an important uh, issue uh, because culture and cultural sites and museums often get neglected during, uh, during uh, economic crisis and political crisis and they get endangered and they get looted and they lose their budgets. And there are international organizations that, that help with, with that. And uh, there was a conference in Amman recently to, uh, to, follow, up, to follow up on that. Um, my only comment on, on UNESCO sites is that UNESCO should also have culture as a as a uh, heritage, not just not just physical sites, because some there are some cultures, some cultural features like tolerance and cosmopolitanism and openness that are threatened, and they also deserve to be uh, preserved as much as as. Uh, uh, beautiful sites that we have in Lebanon, and I look forward to watching. Thank you very much for doing this. Thank you, Nadim, um, and welcome everyone. Nadim is the executive director of our academic center here in New York. Um, I am the director of alumni and special projects at LAU New York. And we are very pleased and happy to have Nada Sarah with us for this exciting and informative presentation. I first experienced this presentation several years ago at the Lebanese consulate here in New York. And afterwards, I had a brief chat with Nada and we eventually decided that uh, we would have her presented here at our academic center, which we did. And then we took it on the road to a couple of our um, alumni chapters. We took it to San Francisco, to Los Angeles, and to Washington, DC. And we had hoped to do more, but then COVID-19 intervened and uh, we never got to do it. Now, with the advent of this webinar technology, we are thrilled to be able to share it uh, globally. Even though I visited all these sites in Lebanon, sometimes twice, I never tire of experiencing this presentation. As you may have read in our promo material, Nada has degrees in Lebanese and French law from St. Joseph University in Lebanon and an LLM in international law from Fordham University here in New York. She has worked with UNESCO for several years and is very well versed in this material. Nada and her husband, Dr. Gabriel Saar, are active in many Lebanese causes and are well-respected members of New York's Lebanese community. Thank you, Nada, for your diligent work on this and for sharing it once again with LAU and our friends. Um, if any of you have any questions during the presentation, please submit them in the chat room and we will try to get to them all afterwards. Nada, it's all yours. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. First, I would like to uh, thank uh, Nadim for the welcome and Ed for this very nice introduction. I'm uh, very honored to uh, talk to you today about the Lebanese sites that are inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. There are five, Biblos, Tyr, Baalbek, Anjar, and a double site the Kadisha Valley, along with the forest of the Cedars of the North, known as Cedars of God. We will go on the site, visit them in detail, but let me first give you an overview of what the UNESCO World Heritage List is about, the selection process and the maintenance effort a selected site has to keep 
in order not to slip on the endangered sites list. Heritage is uh, our legacy from the past, is what we live with today and pass on to future generations. It could be cultural or natural. It could be mixed, both at the same time. But heritage is highly vulnerable. It is threatened with disappearance because of pollution, because of changing economic or social conditions. UNESCO that stands for United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, having noted that the disappearance of a given site would lead automatically to the impoverishment of the heritage of the whole world, has adopted in November of 1972, a convention for the protection, for its protection. It works through a committee of 21 members elected among representative of state parties. Who are the state's parties? The state's parties are those countries who have, <clears throat> sorry, pledged uh, to identify properties that are within their territory and submit them to the committee if they think they are worthy of inclusion. It, they pledged also if a selected, if they have a selected site to keep it in its integrity and authenticity, meaning that if this site comes to be threatened by the effect of armed conflicts, of natural disaster, uh, of an unchecked urban development or um, uncontrolled tourism, if a site gets to be stained by that, then the committee will contact the government or the authorities in question and ask them to cure the stain. This is what happened to some of the Lebanese sites, but the Lebanese authority uh, quickly responded and none of the sites were or went on the endangered sites list. Lebanon has ratified the convention in 1983 and has five listed sites so far. And I say so far because it is open for Lebanon as for any other state party to prepare a nomination file for one of its uh, sites that are listed on a tentative list. They can prepare a file for that and submit it to the committee, hoping for its addition on the official site. Now we're we gonna have a quick refreshing geographic note. Lebanon stretches over 10,452 square kilometers uh, between Syria in the north and east, Israel in the south. Its western coast is on the Mediterranean Sea with Beirut in the middle as its capital, flanked by two cities in the north, Tripoli and Biblos, and two in the south, Saida and Tyr. It has two beautiful chains of mountain, anti-Lebanon and Mount Lebanon, uh, that are parallel to each other and both parallel to the sea. Between them lies an agriculturally rich plain, the Beka Valley. Now, uh, a quick timeline, historic timeline for us to be able to uh, comprehend and identify the different ruins uh, that will be on the sites. Uh, Lebanon's history go back to the prehistoric time uh, because of evidence of life found in its grotto of that uh, time period. But we know more about Lebanon's past uh, starting the 23rd century uh, BC, and we are going now from the bottom up. Uh, on the 23rd century uh, BC, uh, the coast uh, was inhabited by the Canaanite and Amorite. They were Semitic speaking, speaking nomad who came and settled for some centuries before they got absorbed by the Egyptian empire in the 16th century BC. Then in the 12th century BC uh, came uh, sea people from the north. Uh, they brought with them uh, their maritime knowledge and quickly put it to work. 
uh, they built ships from the cedar wood and founded the first trade sea trading nation of the world. Uh, they were called Phoenician by the Greek. They sailed as far as the Atlantic Ocean and founded colonies in the Mediterranean. They prospered, but we know that prosperity attracts enemy. So the Phoenician coast lived under a succession of occupation, starting with the Assyrian Babylonian Empire in the seventh century BC, <clears throat> sorry, followed by the Persian Empire, the Greek one, the Roman one that started around 60 uh, BC and uh, was transformed into the Eastern Roman Empire in the middle of the fourth century AD. The Caliphate, the Latin uh, Crusader states, the Mamluk states, and Lebanon lived for five centuries under the Ottoman Empire from the year 1416 until, until 1920. He got then, or Lebanon got under the French mandate and earned its independence in November 22nd, 1943. It is important to mention that Lebanon sits on a terrain prone to earthquake and a great deal of its ruins are still buried underground and being progressively excavated. Our first site is Biblos. Biblos called different name, but uh, Biblos is the, uh, the name given to this uh, uh, town, Phoenician town that was active in the papyrus trade by the Greek because Biblion means book in Greek. It is at a distance of 37 kilometers north of Beirut, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the world, some seven to eight thousand years. Its ruins are from almost every civilization we saw on the historic timeline. It is known for an extensive trade and for the invention and diffusion of the alphabet. Today, Biblos is a bustling town with a busy street and a fishing port uh, with its marina. But a few meters from the seashore, we stumble on one of the most complex and richest archeological sites of the area. I'm pointing around here, so I tell you a story of how late uh, this site was discovered. In 1922, heavy rains that lasted four days uncovered royal tombs and sarcophagi exactly in here. Among the sarcophagi was the sarcophagus of King Ahiram, and we'll talk about it soon. Uh, I am pointing at the, uh, the oldest ruin on the site, which is the Neolithic huts that are monocellular inhabitation with a crushed limestone, crushed limestone floor. Uh, few, like 3,000 uh, years later, the Calcolithic houses around here uh, were similar in habitation, but way of life was different, as well as the funerary ritual. The deceased were, <clears throat> sorry, were um, laid in uh, um, jars with their earthly possession. 1150 jars were uncovered in Biblos. The temple of Baal -e Jebel from the 2700 BC in dedication of uh, Biblos, goddess Biblos. Let me take you with a picture tour uh, through the rest of the site. Um, the main ruin on the site is the uh, Crusader castle from uh, the 1140. Uh, you go in, into, or you go under its arch door into a very well-preserved uh, fortress with its dungeon and tours. It used to have also a drawbridge and uh, trenches. A good idea is to go on the top and have a good viewing of the surrounding. It has uh, between its wall a little museum displaying tools and weapons from the Stone Age. Uh, 
ancient pottery and those funerary jars we just spoke about. The magnificent temple of Abelisk uh, in a testimony uh, to a very tight trade that used to take place with the Egyptian uh, in the 1200 uh, BC. Uh, the Egyptian used to send Biblos, papyrus roll, linen, alabaster, and gold. And the Biblos, Biblos used to send them back glass, perfume, oil, wine, and guess what? A lot of the cedar wood. In its foundation is this figurine. It was recovered in its foundation. It is in bronze, ornate with a gold leaf. It represents the Phoenician man. It bears witness to the beginning of the Phoenician civilization right here in Byblos. A scenic view with re the reconstructed um, uh, entrance of the royal palace. Uh, this ancient house of the 1920s, many similar houses were around here, but were leveled for the need of the excavation. To the right, we encounter a gem of an amphitheater from the Roman time, 200 year AD. This is how it looked like. And uh, a piece of its mosaic floor is on display in the Museum of uh, Beirut, in the National Museum of Beirut. What is also on display in the National Museum is this sarcophagus of Ahiram, King of Byblos, around the 850 BC. It is important because on its lid, we have the full version of the Phoenician alphabet. As I said earlier, the, the Byblos inhabitants were very, very active trading with the cities around them. What, were, what was available for them to communicate with those cities was the Egyptian hieroglyph. Egyptian hieroglyph were symbols or drawings correspondent to words. You needed to know and memorize hundreds of words to be able to communicate, and that was not practical. So the script of Biblos came up with the Phoenician alphabet that is phonetic and right, written from right to left. This is how it looked like with its correspondent uh, letters of today. The, the alphabet quickly traveled. It was taken in the year 800 BC to Greece by Cadmos. The Greek adopted it and added the vowels to it. Uh, the Greek language gave birth to the Latin language, which itself gave birth to the Russian one. Similarly, in the Middle East, the Phoenician alphabet gave birth to Nabataean, which itself gave birth to the language to Arabic language. In the year 2005, UNESCO declared the Phoenician alphabet part of the Lebanese heritage. Continuing our tour, we see a beautiful Roman colonnade and the base of a Phoenician wall. Uh, the church of St. Uh, John the Baptist from the Crusader time and uh, the mosque, Abdel Majid mosque from uh, the Mamluk time, an Ottoman soup. Biblos has two museums, a wax and fossil museum. It holds an um, international festival every summer and was crowned in 2016, the capital of the Arab tour. Our second site is Tyr. Tyr or Sur, meaning fortification in Arabic, was inscribed on the list in 1984, is at a distance of 80 kilometers south of Beirut, ancient city, not as old as Biblos, but fairly old, 5,000 years. Its ruins are mainly Roman, but also some Phoenician, Byzantine, and Crusader vestige could be found as well. This coastal Phoenician city was known because it used to be the queen of the seas. Uh, and also was famous for the discovery of the purple dye or murex. And we'll speak about it quickly. Uh, Tyr is a fishing town with uh, 250,000 inhabitants, 
uh, its emblem it's, is this beautiful uh, Roman uh, triumphal arch. Uh, we know that uh, Tyre was uh, uh, originally founded in the third millennium before Christ, but uh, it came to a golden age uh, during the, fifth, the first millennium BC. At that time, uh, King Hiram of uh, uh, Tyre was reigning and he had a vision. Uh, first, uh, I want to say that uh, uh, what Tyre looked like uh, was different from what it is today. It was consistent of two parts, uh, the mainland over here, some 800 meter, meter away from Tyr, the island. So Hiram had a vision uh, because uh, uh, trade was flourishing at that time. So he built a port of Sidon in the north and port of Egypt in the south to, to accommodate, I'm sorry, uh, that, uh, that flourishing commerce. Uh, his contemporary, uh, King um, Solomon of uh, Israel, asked him for cedar wood, for workers and architects to build his Jerusalem temple, and Hiram accommodated his request. Also at that time, the Phoenician expansion has, had, um, had uh, started, and uh, the Tyrian uh, merchant had settled and founded colonies in uh, North Africa and Europe like Carthage and Cadiz. So the, the merchants used to come back from those cities with their ships full of goods that were very attractive to everyone. And that also gave, um, gave uh, uh, birth to an inland commerce as well. We don't have also to forget about the Phoenician, uh, about, sorry, the Murex style. At that time, the Murex uh, got uh, very known uh, and the Tyrian were, um, were really making a lot of money out of it because one gram of the Murex dye was worth sometimes 20 grams of gold. Everybody was very excited about having colors on uh, their, their dresses and robes. Uh, but only the, Euro the nobles could afford it. So you imagine the fame and, uh, and wealth that uh, Tyr uh, knew at that time. We know that prosperity attracts um, enemies. And we uh, saw that Nebuchadnezzar came in the year 850s before Christ, besieged Tyr for 13 years, but in vain. It left a tier, Tyr's economy weakened and the Tyrian who were living in the mainland left it to the safety of Tyr, the island. Later in the year 332 before Christ came Alexander the Great. Uh, he besieged Tyr again. He, uh, he um, tried to take it. Uh, but he lost a lot of his men. He got enraged and got the idea to link the mainland to Tyr the island, taking debris and stones from the uh, mainland, as well as a lot of the cedar wood, and built a dam and got close to Tyr. The Tyrian were, no, were known for their heroism. They had uh, surrounded their island with uh, 40 meter high walls and were fighting fiercely. But Alexander defeated them and they paid a very high price uh, for it. 30,000 Tyrian were killed or sold into slavery. After that, Tyr uh, lived under uh, the Greek and Roman Empire, but they had a kind of uh, freedom uh, to mint their own coin and to uh, celebrate their tradition. Uh, they lived also um, uh, peacefully under the Arabs and were allowed to have some kind of commerce. 
it's only around or after the Crusader time that the, the history of Tyr started to decline. Uh, this is an aerial view of uh, Tyr, and you can notice that the little causeway uh, that uh, Alexander the Great built has gained quite in width. It is called today Harir Remel. Also, uh, the mainland used to be over here, and uh, there is an archaeological site that is very important with three groups of uh, ruins that we will discover quickly. Uh, then another site, Almina site, on uh, what used to be uh, the island. And now, of course, we see that Tyr has become a peninsula. So to go and see uh, Albas, we uh, enter under uh, Byzantine arch and walk along necropolis that is from the Roman and Byzantine time. Uh, sometimes the, the sarcophagi uh, looked very luxuriously decorated, indicating that uh, some wealthy trader of Murex uh, was buried there. Um, going under the Roman triumphal arch, we um, walk along the street uh, with a, its colonnade, uh, and uh, an aqueduct just under it that used to ensure uh, the city with its water supply. A few meters to the left, we encounter this Roman hippodrome from the second century AD. It used to be one of the most important and largest of uh, that time, uh, half a kilometer long and 123 meters wide. This is how it looked like. It used to be the scene of a death-defying game, chariot racing. The charioteers had to go seven times around the spina on tracks that were crowded and very tight. Little few, oh, sorry, little uh, really could survive uh, this um, game, but nobles as well as local used to be fond of it. 20,000 spectators could sit around the stadium. Uh, this is how it looks today. It, is, it has been excavated in 1967, the necropolis in 1962, and in 1997, not far from here, was uncovered a Phoenician necropolis. Going now to the Mina site, uh, we see that it is um, a vast district of civic buildings with uh, its uh, streets bordered with colonnades and its uh, sidewalk with mosaic, uh, um, an arena for athletes to train, uh, columns from, in marble from Marmara and in granite from Aswan, a typical Roman city with its uh, terms and baths. We see many columns in the water, indicating that half of the ruins are still under the water. Baalbek is our third site. Baalbek from Baalbek, meaning Baal, god of the Beka, uh, or Heliopolis uh, under the Greek uh, city of the sun, was inscribed in 1984 is at a distance of 87 kilometers northeast of Beirut, an altitude of 1150 meters. Ruins are mainly Roman. It is a temple complex, one of the finest examples of imperial Roman architecture. Baalbek ruins are in the town of Baalbek, which is located uh, at the foot of south slope, south slope of anti-Lebanon. It is Lebanon's greatest Roman treasure, counted among the splendor of the ancient time. Their monumental proportion proclaimed the, the wealth and power of imperial Rome. It is on this tell exactly also that previously in the first millennium before Christ, uh, the, uh, the Phoenician built an enclosed court in here, I'm sorry, let me point at it. Uh, an enclosed port, an enclosed court uh, with an altar and worship their gods. 
the Roman, I sorry, wanted to say that the Roman uh, worshiped uh, Bacchus, the Jupiter, Venus, and Mercury on this side. So later on in the year, uh, in the uh, Hellenistic time, the Greek came and identified a Baalbek god with the god son, with the sun god, I'm sorry, and enlarged the existing port and erected a podium. Uh, this site was excavated in the 1898, very early by the German um, archeologist. Uh, the French archeologist took over in 1922. And uh, today it is the director general of antiquities that has taken over with, um, under the supervision of uh, international archeologists. Those six columns are the emblem of Baalbek. They belong to the colossal temple of Jupiter. This is what Jupiter looked like. It had four structures. The first one that the Roman built was the temple itself in the first uh, century AD. Then followed the great court in the second century and in the third century AD was added the hexagonal court and propylaea or entrance. Adjacent to it is uh, the temple of, of Bacchus that we see here and much further down the temple of Venus. Outside of this complex, we, uh, there was uh, the temple of Mercury of which very little remains. This is what uh, the propylaea of uh, the temple of Jupiter looked like. And this is a picture of the great court with its portico, et cetera, its basin, a tower, and altar. The steps that, leads, that lead to the podium where um, Jupiter used to stand. Uh, the podium is seven meter above the great court and some 13 meters <clears throat> I'm sorry, above the surrounding ground. Um, Jupiter Temple was just massive. Let me give you an idea of its size. So supposedly the, the temple is here. On the west end of the podium is a triliton, which is a group of three stones that are eight uh, that are gigantic, weighing, <clears throat> I'm sorry, weighing each uh, 800 tons. Uh, this is what uh, it looked like, uh, 48, <clears throat> I'm sorry, 48 meters. By 88 meters, used to have uh, 50, 54 columns, 27 of them were still uh, standing in the 16th century. And before <clears throat> the earthquake of uh, 1759, <clears throat> it used to have nine columns. Now the six remaining columns are located right here. They are 20 meter high, uh, joined with an entablature that has a frieze <clears throat> uh, of um, made of um, lion's head joined by garland. And it's and, um, like here, and the thickness is 2.3 meter as we see here compared to a young man. Um, now we move to visit the <clears throat> a little temple of Bacchus as it is called, but Bacchus is no small temple at all. It used to have 42 columns and still has 19 of them. It was built in the second century AD and has been remarkably uh, well preserved. Uh, 33 steps leads to its entrance and the structure sits on a podium five meter high.
we enter it through a loftal, through a loft and monumental gate that is exquisitely carved with Bashic scenes and beautifully ornate. Its interior is impressively nice looking. Its acoustics is excellent, are excellent. This is where piano recitals and concerts for the International Festival of Albeck take place yearly. A few meters down, we visit um, the very small temple of Venus. It does uh, actually contrast in shape and size with the two temples seen so far. It is ornate with uh, dove and seashells, was completed in the third century AD. And when in the fourth century, the Christianity, uh, Christianity was declared the official religion of Rome, uh, Emperor Constantine of Byzantium ordered, ordered all the temples closed. So this Venus temple was transformed into a little church and a basilica was erected in the great court of Jupiter. Uh, after the Arab conquest, um, Baalbek was transformed, <coughs> I'm sorry, into a fortress. And this is why we refer to it in Lebanon as al uh, It um, It is not until, <clears throat> it's not until the, uh, the Mamluk era that, uh, that uh, Baalbek uh, knew an, a calm time. And today it is an active commercial and administrative center in the Northern Bika. Lebanon holds the record for the largest hand carved stone block in the world. It is here in the southern entrance of Baalbek in this quarry that used to give Baalbek its stone. It uh, measures 20 almost 20 meter high. It is 5.6 by six meter thick and weighs an estimated 1,650 tons. Our fourth site is Anjar. Anjar by its name, Ain Jarra, Ain meaning source and Jarra being uh, the name of a nearby town under Hellenistic time, uh, was inscribed on the UNESCO list in 1984, is at a distance of 58 kilometers east of Beirut and an altitude of 950 meters. Its ruins are exclusively Umayyad of the 8th century AD, a testimony to the Umayyad civilization. In Anjar, we witnessed the development of an Islamic architecture per se. Anjar's setting is the Beka Valley. But Anjar is very different from uh, the archaeological sites of Lebanon we've seen so far. While other um, sites, we see a superposition of uh, ruins uh, belonging to different civilization, Anjar is only one. It's the Omayyads. And while the other sites are millennia old, this one is fairly new from the 8th century AD. While Tyre and Byblos used to be coastal commercial uh, centers, Anjar is the example of an inland commerce center. It used to tie Baalbek, Homs, and Damascus to the south. Experts like Tanjar for the precious information it holds on the Omayyads. The Omayyads, the first dynasty, uh, the first hereditary, hereditary dynasty of Islam ruled from Damascus after the Prophet Muhammad uh, from 700, sorry, from 600 and 60 AD till 750. They are credited with uh, the 
uh, Arab conquest that created an empire that stretched from the Hindus Valley to Southern France. It is the Caliph uh, Marwan bin Abd al-Malik who founded and uh, built Anjar between the year 705 and 715 AD. It only lived a few decades, uh, contrasting one more time with the other sites in Lebanon, uh, which uh, um, uh, witnessed continuous uh, inhabitation for long periods of time. Uh, they lived on this almost quadrilateral, um, um, uh, some 385 by 350 meter, uh, surrounded by um, a two meter thick wall flanked with uh, 40 towers. Uh, this site had uh, two huge intersecting, intersecting axes in, in its middle, uh, reminiscent of the early Roman uh, city planning style. Uh, they were cutting or dividing the site into four quarters. In the southeast quarter, we could uh, see the great palace and the mosque. In the uh, northeastern quarter used to be the little palace for the harem and the bath. The bath, uh, very similar to uh, the Roman one, had street three structures for water, for hot cold and warm water and large vestiaries indicating that like the Roman, the, Ottoman, the, sorry, the Umayyad used to socialize there. The Northwestern uh, quarter was dedicated to second functions and administration and the West uh, Southern one for the residences. The site was excavated in 1945. This is a view of the one of the two intersecting streets um, with a colonnade. Uh, it's bordered with colonnade. Uh, this used to be the front of shops. 600 shops were counted in Anjar, giving it uh, the right to, give, to, to uh, call itself the major strip mall. Looking at the columns, we see that they are equi um, or uh, evenly spaced, but they are in no way homogeneous, telling us that the Omayyad used to help themselves at elements from other civilization. They gave their columns elements from the Byzantine and Greek. Uh, dominating uh, the ruins are this uh, spectacular reconstructed tetrapile. Tetrapile used to mark the angles of the intersection. Uh, also, what is dominating uh, the ruins uh, is the, uh, are the walls of the Great Palace, uh, its um, uh, colonnades um, and arches that are from, uh, that, uh, sorry, the colonnades that, um, uh, of which uh, three stories uh, are preserved. So we know that the, the Omayyad were recyclers that they took from Roman, from the Roman, their city planning style. They took from uh, the Greek and the Byzantine, their um, uh, column style. They took also from the Byzantine, uh, the Byzantine, I'm sorry, their masonry. They built their wall like them, alternating a course of red stone, I mean, of brick, sorry, with cut stone. This is a method that will counter the effect of earthquake. So in summary, although the Omayyad uh, helped themselves to uh, other um, architectural styles than theirs, we see in Anjar an evolution and a development of an Islamic architectural style or Islamic art per se. In 754, um, uh, Caliph Ibrahim, son of uh, Walid, was defeated by his cousin, uh, and Anjar was partly um, destroyed. It uh, was abandoned ever since. Today, Anjar is uh, a calm town 
home to 30,000 Armenians. Our fifth and last site is the Kadisha Valley and the Cedars of God. Kadisha means holy and the valley, sorry, holy in Aramean. And the valley was inscribed on the UNESCO list in 1998. It's at a distance of 11 and 19 kilometer northeast of Beirut, an altitude of more than a thousand meter. It is one of the most important early Christian monastic settlements in the world. The Kadisha Valley is located at the uh, foot of Mount Macmel, south of Mount Macmel, and west of the forest of the Cedars of God. Uh, through it runs the Kadisha River that takes its source at the Kadisha Grotto that is itself at the foot of uh, the Cedars of Lord. Its uh, sides are stiff uh, and ragged cliffs full of caves and grottos that used to be, uh, that used to be, uh, that you, that, sorry, uh, were used for meditation and um, uh, refuge as far back as the third millennium before Christ. The inhabitants of the valley were mainly Christian. Uh, but there was also Muslim Sufi who lived in the valley. Uh, the, the group of uh, um, Christian that were there were Syrian and Greek Orthodox. There were also Armenian, Nestorian, and a few, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and few Ethiopians. But the main religious group of the valley were Maronites. They came, uh, and fled to the valley uh, as early as the seventh century AD. And their number increased uh, in the 10th century when the monastery of St. Maron next to Hama in Syria got destroyed. So they lived mainly in the monastery of Kashaya, and we'll speak about it quickly. They were surrounded with a beautiful nature that suitable for contemplation and prayer as so. And they lived on grains and grapes that they grew on terraced fields and on olive as well. This is a map of the Kadisha Valley. Um, it, used, it is really full of monasteries and sacred places. I pointed at the four most important monastery of the valley and at Diman, which is the summer residence of the Maronite Patriarch. Uh, Kanubin was founded in the first fourth century AD. And uh, it is also important beyond the fact that it was the refuge of the Maronite who came and settled there and lived in it. Uh, as early as the seventh century, it is also the seat of the Maronite uh, Patriarch. Uh, it was the seat from actually uh, for four century until the year 1823, when it was moved to Diman, right in here. And uh, was lastly moved to Pkerke in 1830. The second most important monastery is uh, Antony of Kashaya, uh, founded also in the fourth century and in the 16th century, uh, used to shelter the first printing press of the Middle East. It used the Syriac um, character and uh, later moved to the Arabic language. Uh, the third monastery is um, Lady of Hauka. Uh, it, is, uh, un it is actually uh, under a grotto, the great grotto of Hauka, where archaeological finds indicated life as early as the Paleolithic time and also from the Roman and medieval time as well. Um, our fourth um, monastery is Marlisha. 
very close to the eastern entrance of the valley. This is how it looks like, cut really at the facade of the rock. It holds uh, two monas two orders, the Maronite Solitary Order and the Barefoot Carmelite Order. It was founded in the 14th century. And a, a, pic a picture of uh, the monastery of um, Canubin that is also built within the rock, as you see, it holds a monastery, old frescoes, a chapel, and accommodation for uh, visitors. Uh, the Maronite monks were known for their piety, specifically in the 17th century, and scores of uh, poets, author, writers, and clergymen came to the valley to visit, to live sometime, and, so and often to live forever. Going up to, uh, to the north, we pass by Sherry, the uh, birth town of uh, Gibran, Khalil Gibran, and arrived uh, at the Cedars of the Lord Forest. It is a sacred forest and mentioned in the Bible over a hundred times. Was inscribed in 1998 along with the Kadisha Valley at a distance of 121 kilometers northeast of Beirut, an altitude of almost 2,000 meters, home to the endemic Cedrus Libani, most highly prized building material of the ancient world. As remote as they are, the cedars were not untouched by history. This little grove that you see here used to, cow to cover the whole mountain. It used to have also pine, oak, and cypress trees. But we know that it's the very quality of the cedar that brought its destruction. The cedar wood can be cut into long and smooth logs that harden and make solid construction. It is fragrant and uh, bitter. So its bitterness actually keeps the insects away. And this is why cedar wood could last centuries or millennia. Let me show you a picture that I took from a reconstructed little boat, solar boat, at the foot of Cheops Pyramid that was uh, actually 5,000 years, mainly made out of cedar wood. Uh, the <coughs> cedar, <coughs> sorry, the cedar cone go upward <coughs> toward the sky and the cedar tree uh, has to go high, 30 to 40 meter high before it starts to stretch its branches like a fan. Its trunk can be some 12 or 15 meter measure. Uh, we have many cedar forests in Lebanon. We have quite a few still in the north and other parts uh, than Cherry. And we have more in uh, the Shouf. But this is precisely this one that is inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Because every civilization that we saw on the timeline came, I mean, took the expedition to this mount and uh, to help themselves at the timber of the cedar. We start with the Egyptian who used it for their tombs and uh, use the resin for their mummification uh, ritual. Uh, Nabucodonosor, who boasted, I'm sorry, before that, the Phoenician who uh, built their um, merchant ships, their merchant fleet with it. Uh, the Babylonian Nabucodonosor was boasting that with his own hands, he cut uh, cedar wood. Uh, the Greek, built their war fleet with it, their statues, and Alexander the Great used it heavily to build his dam to get here. Later, the Roman as well, and in the modern time, uh, the Ottoman who built railways with it. 
Even today, farmers and villagers would go up the mountain and help themselves to the cedar of the to the cedar wood. So the forest has been destroyed, but there was also concern about its protection. As early as the second century AD, um, Emperor, Roman Emperor Hadrian declared it an uh, imperial uh, domain and attempted to get it enclosed within uh, boundary markers, uh, two of which uh, can be seen at the AUB Museum in Beirut. Uh, Queen Victoria in the year 1876 uh, financed the um, construction of a wall to protect the little saplings from the goats. And today in the uh, modern time, in 1985, uh, was actually founded the, seed, the Friends of the Cedars Forest, the Committee of the Friends of the Cedar Forest, who has been very active in uh, weeding the ground, uh, fertilizing it, um, building, um, I'm, I'm sorry, installing a lightning rod and building paths, a path for the tourists to get uh, on it and keep the grounds clear and specifically been, have been um, planting new saplings. The, Ministry of uh, Environment has helped also providing the sapelin with uh, the right condition within an environment with a germination program. And hopefully we will pass on a rejuvenated uh, cedar heritage to the next generation. Uh, this is a picture of the little sapelin that I added just recently, gives you an idea. Uh, hopefully in 40 years, uh, it will be uh, fairly, fairly tall. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed uh, the journey through uh, the Lebanese sites that are inscribed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, let's pledge to all, cherish them, preserve them, and promote them forever. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nada. That, um, as always, is very informative and fascinating. Um, I certainly hope that many of you will someday be able to visit Lebanon if you've never been there or, or return if you have been once before. I, I am looking forward to my next visit when the pandemic allows. All right, um, I think this was a great experience. We're happy to do it for all of you. And we will follow up with some contacts and other information with the many of you who have asked questions. Thank you. Thank you again, You're Nada. Right. And uh, thank you, Nadim. And have a great day, everyone. Stay safe. Bye-bye.